This video is exclusively dedicated to the Unit 1 practice exam. In our first question, uh, we're dealing with the Pythagorean theorem in part. And what we want to do is find the perimeter of the figure, and we're going to round to the nearest tenth if necessary. So just a couple of key things. Make sure that our rounding is correct. And the distance around the figure is what the perimeter is. So I need to know this distance right here. And if I count boxes, mm -hmm. I'll notice that that's seven blocks long or seven boxes long. And down across the bottom, that's eight units. But it's this diagonal portion that I don't know. And for that, I will use the Pythagorean theorem. So we're just going to put our seven here and our eight here. And of course, the Pythagorean theorem says that if you add the square of the legs, we're going to get the square of the hypotenuse. 7 squared and 8 squared are 49 and 64 respectively. When I add those together, I get 113. And so 113 equals c squared, so I take the square root of both sides, and I get 10.63. Now, 10.63, rounded to the nearest tenth, of course, is 10.6. So when I, I add up all three of those values, I get 25.6 to the nearest tenth. The reason that I added them all up is again, perimeter is the distance all the way around. So if you were to go from E to F, F to G, and G to E, that whole distance is 25.6 units. Now I put units because we didn't have any units here, but say we had these boxes were worth one foot, then I would say 25.6 feet. All right, next page. I guess for you, it's not the next page, it's the next problem. Anyway, onward and upward, uh, we have an anchor line, right? It's talking about this anchor line is right here as it's labeled in the picture. For a tower, it needs to be replaced and the tower is 96 feet tall and the anchor line is 105 feet long. How far from the tower? So what we're looking for is this length right here. That's my X as mm -hmm. noted in my uh, answer key. So again, we're going to apply the Pythagorean theorem, and just keep in mind, I drew my little box, my arrow pointed towards the hypotenuse, making sure that c squared is the 105 squared, right? I didn't put the 105 over here with the 96 because this is the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse is c. So 96 squared plus x squared equals 105 squared. After I square those numbers, I get some pretty big values. I subtract 92 uh, 16 from each side, and that leaves me with 1,809 equals x squared. I take the square root of both sides, and I get x is approximately 42.53. It says to the nearest foot, so I, my eyes look to this number right here. Since that is a 5, that means that I'm going to round up. 5 or bigger, remember, that means that that rounds up. So the final answer is 43 feet. This next question might be a little bit confusing in the fact that they said the distance, notice I boxed up the important pieces, the distance between streets is 264 feet and the distance between avenues is 750 feet. Here's 750, so the distance between these two things, these must be avenues. I just label those avenue blindly. And then this distance right here is 264, that was the distance between streets, so I just said this was street A and street B. And all it says is, or ask, I should say, is um, you walk straight starting from uh, one point to another, and you go down this street and up this avenue. If you to walk diagonally straight through, which I guess would probably be impossible unless it was a park, you can't walk through buildings, how far would the distance be to the nearest tenth of a foot? So again, I drew my box right here, arrow to the hypotenuse. Looks like we're looking for the hypotenuse. So my hypotenuse is x squared. So I have 264 squared plus 750 squared equals x squared. After squaring my values, I get these big numbers right here, still equal to x squared. When I combine them, I get 632,196. Take the square root of both sides. And after I take the square root of x squared, I get x and after I take the square root of 632,196, I get approximately 795.1. That is rounded correctly to the nearest tenth of a foot. And so my final answer is 795 and one tenth of a foot. Now, we move on to translations. How do I know? Because the 
heading said translations up here. And it asked me to translate the parallelogram by a vector of 3, negative 2. Now that 3, negative 2 means to go 3 to the right and down 2. So it's down 2 and 3 to the right. So all I did was I took my coordinates from the original parallelogram. I said, hey, A is at negative 1, 1. So A is at negative 1, 1. And B is at negative 4, 1. And C is at negative 5, negative 1, so on and so forth. Then what? I added 3 to negative 4 to get negative 1. I added 3 to negative 1 to get 2. I added 3 to, get for, to negative 5 to get negative 2, and so on and so forth. Why am I adding? Because 3 is positive, and it's moving to the right, which means to add 3. Now, for the negative 2 aspect of the game, we're going to be moving downward. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1, and 1 minus 2 is negative 1, and um, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, and negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Now I have my new coordinates, I plotted them on the graph, and I land there. And I used a nice straight edge to draw a quality picture. The other thing too is I could have counted over 3, so 1, 2, 3 hops, 1, 2 hops down, lands me there. But I need to identify the coordinates of my prime figure. So I want the figure and the coordinates written. Okay, let's try again. Okay, next problem. You'll notice I have a little bit of an augmentation in my wording. I changed the wording on your copy. It should, it should be nice typed. Uh, draw a segment through these two points. And so here's my segment. I used a nice straight edge. Hopefully you did too. And now we want to move along this vector, right? Uh, 3, 2. Notice um, the notation, sometimes they use a, a hard bracket like that. I know that you're used to seeing the brackets, you know, sharp like that. Same, same gig. So what are we going to do? We have this 3 for the x coordinate, right? And what that's telling us is to move the x, all the x's to the right, right? So we're going to move this way. And we're also going to move up because the 2 is positive. So I'm taking the x from the a and the x from the b, and I'm going to add 3 to both of those. So 1 plus 3 is 4, and 2 plus 3 is 5. Then I'm going to take the 2, and I'm going to add that to the y's, respectively. So 3 plus 2 is 5, and 5 plus 2 is 7. Plot my two new points here. So 4, 5 is 1, 2, 3, 4, up 5. I plot a prime, prime I plot b prime, connect them with a nice straight edge, and we're done. Now this is more of a composite uh, vector question, or composite translation. So you got Isaiah and Izzy are translating a triangle. Izzy translates it by the vector 5, 3. So moving to the right 5 and up 3. Then what happens is Isaiah decides to translate it again um, by the vector 2, negative 1. So where does this thing go now? Now it goes to the right 2 and down 1. So if you um, go to the right 5 and then to the right 2, I think you've gone to the right 7. And if you went up 3 and then down 1, then 3... Right, that positive 3 minus 1 would give you an up 2 overall. So it says, what single vector would they have been able to do to do this in one step? Well, if you go 5 right and 2 right, I guess you went 7 right. And if you went up 3 and then down 1, then I guess you just went up 2 overall. So our final answer is a vector of 7, 2. And now we change focus again to rotations. Right, and I put a little note on my paper, counterclockwise unless otherwise stated. So if you just take one point, not a whole figure, just one point, and you rotate it according to the following, where would it go? Well, 90 degrees counterclockwise, here's my rule. X, Y goes to opposite of Y, X, so they flip-flop, and the number in the front's going to change sign. So when they flip-flop, the 6 becomes positive, and the 2 stays. 180 degrees, they stay in the same order. X, Y goes to opposite X, opposite of Y. 
So they stay in the same order as they are here, but both of their signs change. 2 was positive, now it's negative. 6 was negative, now it's positive. And the 270, very similar to the 90 in terms of they're going to flip-flop order, and the second number, uh, after you flip-flop their order, will change signs. So the negative 6 goes to the front, the 2 goes to the back, and the 2 changes to a negative. And what I did here is I just drew a little sketch to show that um, the original point, I just called it point A, and the first part is if I rotated it 90 degrees, it should have landed up here. If I rotated 100 degree, 180, it should have landed there. And if I rotated it 270, it should have landed here. And I just give a rough sketch. So just negative 6, negative 2. If I go negative 6, negative 2, I do land right here. And if I started in quadrant 4, I should land in quadrant 3 after going 270 degrees. And that checks out. And that's what I did with my other points too, just to make sure I'm correct. So now we're rotating full images. This one says rotate the image 90 degrees. And again, counterclockwise and otherwise, unless otherwise stated. And 90 degrees should go from quadrant 2 to quadrant 3. My rule says to flip-flop the values and change the sign of the front number. So when I flip-flop negative 3, 3, the positive 3 goes to the front, the negative 3 goes to the back, and the front number is going to change to a negative. So I do that for all of my points. So for this particular problem, I identified all my initial coordinates. Then I used my rule to write the new prime coordinates and make the changes according to that rule. Once I had my prime coordinates, then I plot it, negative 3, 3. And as you notice, um, I have failed to identify my prime location. So let me put that in there now. Okay. So now I've rectified my labeling over here, and we're ready to start rotating the image 270. 270 should bring us around to quadrant 1. Why? We're in quadrant 2. This is 90, 180, 270. So it looks like my answer landed in the right place. And what I did is I took all of the coordinates again, same coordinates that were over here, labeled them all, applied my rule. Notice the difference between the 90 and the 270 is that they both change order, but on the 270, it's the x coordinate that's going to go to the opposite. So negative 3, 3 becomes positive 3, 3. Negative 3, 2 becomes uh, 2, positive 3. Negative 2, 0 becomes 0, positive 2. And 0, 0 stays 0, 0. All right, let's move on. I don't think there's any explanation here. Um, this is where the rules are. So uh, this is just a matter of looking at your notes and filling it in. Now, before I attempt to answer this question, I might skip to number two and talk about the rules for reflecting. So reflecting about the y equals x line, x, y switches spots. When I cross over the x-axis, so just think about that. When I'm over here and I go across, I'm sorry, the y-axis, I go over here. So what's going to change? The x is going to flip-flop signs. Uh, conversely, if I started on this side and went to this way, the x would change sign. So it doesn't mean that the x is going to be negative. It means that the x changes sign. And also, if I were to start up here and go over the x-axis, then I'm going to change the y value. So the y value is the opposite. So x, y goes to x opposite of y. So now I go up to my picture and I say, well, you know, what exactly were we looking at up here? And we have this triangle on the left reflects across, it looks like it reflected across the y-axis. So P went to P prime. P originally was negative 1, 4, and now it's 1, 4. So it sounds like the x value changed. So this was a reflection about the y-axis. So that's why I said this is a reflection across the y-axis. And the rule, of course, was the rule that's associated with reflecting across the y-axis. On the test, the only rules you'll be able to bring with you on a card, and we'll make it for you, are the rotation rules. So this you'll have to um, identify on your own by arguing it out logically on paper. Here, just a few quick reflections across the y-axis. So I started originally with t, so I gotta go that distance 
from the y-axis on this side and conversely for E and I. So here is my new picture and along with my new picture are the coordinates. Um, and I just counted those out. On the next photo or uh, figure over here, we go across the x-axis, which means we're going to go from I to I prime, T to T prime, E to E prime. If E was one unit away on the bottom, then E is going to be one unit away on the top. Uh, if E is, or if, I'm sorry, if I is one, two, three on the bottom, then I is going to be one, two, three on the top. And then record down in the proper spaces here, the corresponding prime locations, and then move on. Here we have a composition of transformations as we discussed most recently in class. And so we're going to reflect T across these two intersecting lines. And these lines form a 72 degree angle. So I take the T and I reflect it across this way first and then across this way second. So first across line AB, then across line CB. And that T is going to land in this general vicinity over here. And what we want to know is what's a single transformation that will result in the same final image. So instead of two reflections, we would have one rotation. Now we need to have which way is the rotation happening. So since we are going this way, this is going to be a clockwise rotation of twice the angle of the intersection formed. Or I should say twice the angle that was formed by the intersection of the lines. So 72 times 2 is 144 degrees. So what's the single transformation? A clockwise rotation of 144 degrees. So the rotation, the degrees, and the direction. Right? Three items that you got to get across. Down at the bottom, suppose that we reflect an emoji across horizontal line M, and then over horizontal line N. So what do we have? Two lines, and it's going to have our double reflection. How could you get the smiley face all the way down there in one shot? The distance between these two lines is four units. So remember in class we said we'll double that distance. So four times two is eight. So we have to say that it's a vertical translation, right? Direction and the transformation named, just like we said, clockwise rotation, direction and a transformation. Direction, vertical, transformation is a translation and how much, by how much, we're going to go 8 units, or also 0, negative 8 in vector form is another way to say that one short and sweet. So we have some symmetry. Sketch an example that has point symmetry, and then tell me whether or not it has rotational symmetry. So I drew a square, and I said a square has point symmetry because it maps onto itself at 180 degrees, or you could say that it looks the same upside down. And I did not mention uh, if it had rotational symmetry, but I guess a good way to clarify now um, that, uh, yes, it does have rotational symmetry because it looks the same at 90 degrees, at 270 degrees, and at 180 degrees, automatically, if it has point, it immediately has rotational. So I forgot to write that part down. You can sort of write that in, in that space. Sketch a quadrilateral that has two lines, right, at least two lines of symmetry, and show the location of those lines. So I just gave two examples. There's two. It also has these diagonal ones. Here's a triangle. Right? It's an equilateral triangle, and it has symmetry this way, this way, and this way. So at least two. So I gave two examples. So I went uh, overboard on number two, but uh, we're going to give Mr. Brecklin only half credit here, as he has failed to handle the second part of this question. Whoops. On our dilation question, the big factor here is the K factor. Notice I said this is an enlargement. So I took all of my original points of A, B, and C. I listed them here. Then what? I multiplied everybody there by three. Zero, zero times three is still zero, zero. Three, one becomes nine, three. And one, two becomes three, six. I plotted those. I used a nice straight edge to draw my lines. We labeled everybody, and is this an isometry? No, why not? Because we changed the size. So no, because there's a change in size. All right, moving onward and upward onto a little mix and match. First, give an example of a transformation that is an isometry, and then one that is not. 
I just went with reflections for the example of one that is. And the reason that it is is because it doesn't change size or shape, right? They don't change size or shape. You gotta mention both to explain why they are an isometry. To not be an isometry, you only have to break one of those rules. You don't have to break both, but just one. And dilations are our only example of what is not an isometry at this point, and that's because they change size. They certainly don't change the shape. Now, the next thing is we take one point P, and we're gonna say where P prime is after doing a couple of different things. So first we're gonna reflect about the x-axis. So what happens when we go across the x-axis? Our y value changes. Now what happens here? It looks like perhaps Mr. Brecklin has an error. Where's my error? I changed the y value. So again, another oopsie on Mr. Brecklin's part. So this is really supposed to be negative three, positive five. And if you notice, even my sketch, I missed it in my little sketch. So my sketch should have said negative three, negative five is here, and it's going to go across the x-axis, so it should be negative three, positive five. Okay, then a reflection about the y equals x should be just flip-flopping these backwards, so negative five, negative three, I did okay there, and 90 degrees counterclockwise, our rule is xy goes to negative yx, so the five comes to the front, becomes opposite sign, which is now positive, and the x goes to the back, or the y spot, and it remains the same, so that's good. If we started again in quadrant three, and we went backwards counterclockwise one rotation, we should be in quadrant four, and that's where five negative three would land us, so that's pretty good. So again, a little boo-boo on my part here. Good thing we're talking these out. That's how we catch our mistakes. The last problem, I just have handwritten the midpoint formula for the two uh, coordinates here. We have a uh, negative five comma seven and a negative seven comma nine. So again, um, the midpoint is just adding the two x coordinates. So negative five plus a negative seven is a negative 12 divided by two is negative six. And then seven plus nine, our y values is gonna be 16 divided by two is eight. So our final answer looks like this. And I drew a little quick sketch. If one point was there and one point's there, my negative six looks like six eight looks like it lands in the middle, so that's good. So overall, not too shabby. So I'm glad that I've worked through these problems with you. I've caught a few of my own mistakes on the answer key, and that's what this is all about. Uh, thinking it through, working it through, and being prepared. On the test, uh, just try to work slowly and try to avoid making the mistakes that I made. Hopefully this helped you out. Good luck.